let's see what we can do. David, did you have a a poem or, or a reading or something at the beginning? Yes, I do have a poem today. And I was thinking when I was uh, finished high school and at my first year in McGill, I uh, was, I got, my dad used to get the New York Times on Sundays and I was just leafing through the paper and I discovered this poem, which caused me to laugh so hard. I've never forgotten it. At the time with Saturn, the, moon, the rings of Saturn and the moons of Saturn, we thought only had nine moons, of which the last one was named Phoebe. Now Saturn is known to have over 80 moons. But in those days, Phoebe was the only moon that revolved the wrong way. It went around retrograde instead of prograde. So instead of like this, it went like that, confusing everybody. And this is the poem that I found that day in the New York Times. Phoebe, Phoebe, whirling high in our neatly plotted sky. Phoebe, listen to my lay. Won't you whirl the other way? We <laughs> prescribed in terms exact just how every star should act. Just tell where, where to go and whirl at night. Phoebe, can't you get it right? We really know you are so strange. But really, we can't rearrange all of our charts from Mars to Hebe just to fit a moon like Phoebe. <laughs> Is that Octa Nash? Who's the poet? No, I think it's apparently it's uh, listed as anonymous. So I don't know. Huh. But it sounds it, like it could be Octa Nash. It does sound like, it, it could like be, it's yeah. Octa Nash. Kind of, kind it, could, it could have been, but certainly someone with a sense of humor. Right. Okay. Um, before we even say the blessing and get into the sacred work, um, I'm. It, it turns out, looking at the calendar, I'm not going to be able to to be here on uh, September 12th, which would be the second second Monday of the month. Um, and I was wondering if we could find an alternative date. Um, Ruthann, you're, you're involved. Are you involved in the study session for the, uh, generally? Yes. Generally. Yes. I'm, I'm trying. I would prefer not to be, but yes. Do you want an, ex do you want an excuse not to be? I uh, would love an excuse not to be. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, um, we, so we could move to the 19th or we could move to some other day that might be if, uh, if it, it just I'm going to be traveling coming back from a family bar mitzvah on on the, on the 12th. So Muzzle Tov, Rabbi, that's a good yes. happy event. I'm sorry? That's a good happy event, Muzzle Tov. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's not at it's not at my old synagogue. It's at a different synagogue. They had oh. they had the chutzpah. <laughs> uh, cousins cousins had the chutzpah to belong to a different synagogue. Uh, what do you you know? What are you gonna do? Um, what's so? Uh, I I mean I would lean towards you, Ruthann. What do you think? Can should we schedule it, or even if you just got us started or something? Yep. On that's on fine. the Zoom. That's fine. Is it, would, the, would the morning of the 19th be available for everybody? I at like least, that date. For the regulars? Yeah, because I'll be on the 12th too. Okay. Okay, that calendar's clear. All right. I'm just checking. A after having the fiasco of the wrong calendar or not updating the. On September the 19th, I should not forget because that is my parents' anniversary date. Yes. Oh, okay. The 19th is fine. And as far as Zoom goes, I mean, I can always start that from uh, from my yeah. phone, number one. Number two, it's great because then um, we'll make Gloria happy. No, but we can't have a hybrid meeting. Right. She doesn't like hybrid meetings. I don't right. like okay. hybrid All meetings. Right. So let's plan, let's plan on... on Monday the nineteenth instead of the instead of the twelfth. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, and then and please join me with the bracha Baruch Hata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav B'Tzivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. 
We have the sacred, the sacred opportunity of busying ourselves with things of Torah. Um, so we actually go back to the end of the book of Numbers of the Midbar, and then we begin Deuteronomy, Devarim in Hebrew. Uh, so we'll spend some time on, on those parshiot, on, on those Torah portions and chapters, but also, as, uh, as you're probably aware by now, uh, over the weekend, we, uh, we, we observed Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of, of Av, uh, and, and I wanted to also uh, uh, include a little bit of, the, of reading from, from Lamentations uh, and explain where that comes from in, mm -hmm. the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and what the connection is to uh, 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 to our tradition, our history, and then th th we sh we sh should have some time, Steve, uh, and we'll get into some conversation about what's what's going on. The last I last I heard, incidentally, is that there there's a ceasefire and it is and it is holding. So good. Okay, uh, that's that's good. as of about Thank an God. hour ago, which was the last uh, last communication I had. Okay, so the uh, this year is one of those years where um, uh, where there's a double portion of the last two shorter portions of Bamid Bar of Numbers. Uh, they're called Matot Masse. Begins with the with chapter thirty, actually with verse two of chapter thirty of Numbers, and continues through the end of, end end of the book. Um, Matot, uh, the Hebrew word which means the tribes. Um, the um, uh, for, begins with a discussion of the the laws regarding taking a vow or making an oath and taking a vow. Uh, we we could be talking about this on Yom Kippur with Kol Nidre, but uh, taking of vows and it's and it's uh, one interesting point is that um, a, a a woman. Uh, can make a vow in in the Torah, and, it's, and it specifies that if a, that if a woman makes a vow, such and such will uh, will take place, especially if she is unable to fulfill the vow. Now, rather than concentrating on what the vow might be, Moses, in his teaching, if you will, uh, 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 makes a difference, a distinction between. Um, a minor child, a, a, a girl, if you will, and by minor they mean uh, unmarried. They mean single. Uh, all the words for minor, uh, virgin, unmarried, they all run together in in the text. But um, uh, if if a if a single woman, quote unquote, a virgin, a young woman, or a wife made made the vow then only her father or her husband uh can um uh, uh can uh, uh what, what's the right word can can respond either uh verify or validate the vow or punish her for not accomplishing the vow uh, the, the, so the father or the husband, in, in essence, flip it the other side, ha, can, uh, has to agree to her making this vow. We'll put it, we'll put it that way. And if, um, if she still goes ahead and makes this promise and bring God's name into the vow that she would make, uh, but if the father or the husband doesn't agree, then the, the consequences are totally different. Um, but if she's a, a divorcee or if she's a widow, uh, the Torah is aware of both of those classifications of, of women. Uh, if she's a, a divorcee or a, or a widow, then she can make the vow on, on her own. In other words, as, as some of us have been talking about on the Saturday morning Torah, Torah study class, that uh, at this point in most of the tribes, the women were considered the property 
the possession either of uh, either of her father or of her husband, and what are the consequences of acts that she might make on her own. So Matot begins with discussing that. There's war um, against the Midianites and the Moabites, um, and there's questions of uh, were the Israelites really supposed to slay every male uh, of the enemy which they encountered? Um, were they supposed to uh, take all the children and uh, and the women? Uh, were they supposed to take them captive? Uh, apparently, yes, although there's there's disagreement as to male children of some of the women who were taken captive as whether they were supposed to be slaughtered also. Um, there's a ceremony of ritual cleansing for those who have uh, have killed in in battle, um, as well as uh, a ritual uh, uh, of, of cleansing that might be related to what's later referred to as uh, the as tevilah, as the mikvah ritual of cleansing them as uh, a part of coming into the into the community, um, and um, so there was this particular ceremony. Uh, and all of the booty, whether that's people or whether that's material, uh, was all divided up by the tribes, uh, with some being reserved and set aside for the Kohanim and the Levi'im, for the, the priests and the, and the Levites, the, the assistants. Um, the tribes of Gad and Reuben request that they should be, be able to inherit uh, or their portion of the territory uh, yet to be conquered, but that theirs would be on the east side of the Jordan. Don't forget that as the as Moses and the Israelites, led by Joshua, are going to be conquering uh, or entering the land, they're coming from the east towards the west, crossing over the, the Jordan, I like to call it the Jordan Stream, rather than the Jordan River. It's, it's but, um, contrary, to the, contrary to the song. But Gad and Reuben... Uh, request territory in the area that now we would call near the Golan Heights, uh, the area of, uh, of Bashan. Um, and uh, there's an argument as to whether, are they doing that because they they don't want to go into battle? Or they are they doing that because um, that's the most fertile land for their, uh, for their cattle, the, the cattle of that area, even to this very day, uh, are considered a, a, a very, uh, very special species. Um, uh, so there's an argument um, that uh, um, with Reuben, God, and the half tribe of Manasseh as to whether they will cross the cross the Jordan or whether they can just stay up there in the area of the Golan. Moses's response is, "Yes, we will assign you, or we will, will you, we will give you that that territory when we divide up." the land but first you have to because there was question of your bravery and of your willingness to participate in the battles you're going to be the shock troops you're going to be the ones out front uh in in battle to prove to the rest of the people that you indeed uh have uh, have not been uh uh that, that you've not been um reticent to to join uh, in the in the conquest, um, so that resolves the the first of the two double of the the two chapter, the two portions, uh, Matot and Masay. Masay, um, I, I spoke about it at services last week, and I I, I said you might call it dear diary uh, because it begins with like a personal journal. Uh, Moses is starting to recount all the different places. Um, what um, uh, one of the rabbis that 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 I uh, served as a, uh, when I was serving as associate rabbi, he gave a he gave a sermon about this, and he said what what Moses was doing was was giving the people memory triggers. Uh, now I don't know whether that's a technical uh, psychoanalytical term or not, but he said these, these will be memory triggers. Whenever you hear of this particular place, or whenever you hear of this particular name, it's going to trigger a memory of what happened 
to you and to our people during during the journeys. I thought that was an interesting interesting approach to it. Um, Moses again defines the the borders um, and the procedure that will be followed for dividing up the land once they have conquered it uh, and preparing the people for conquest by retelling their their journey and the fact that God was with them. Uh, he's uh, you know he's uh, uh, trying to give a an inspirational uh, motivational talk to them before before battle. Um, that last portion in the book of Numbers includes the death of Aaron. This is his older brother who dies at the end of the journey in front of the three of Mount Hur. Um, Moses also then sets up six cities of refuge, uh, a, a place where, or sanctuary, uh, a place where someone who had unintentionally, uh, unintentionally, accidentally, killed someone when the when the talmud goes into describing it it's as if someone was chopping chopping a tree with an axe and the axe and the uh uh not the handle what's it what's it called the blade uh flies off the the axe handle and strikes someone in the head and kills him so but the the family of the victim is still going to be angry and still wants vengeance uh against the the uh unintentional uh, an intentional killer. Uh, so they arranged this system by which someone who unintentionally kills can seek refuge um, in uh, in one of these six cities that were spread out, uh, that would be spread out throughout the throughout the territory. Uh, there would be a trial, uh, and if he was deemed uh, or found guilty, um, uh, if there was some intent involved. Uh, he would serve his um, uh, uh, his confinement still in one of those one of those cities. He uh, but if he was uh, found if he was acquitted if he was found innocent, then uh, he had to wait until the death of the high priest, uh, the high priest at the time, um, and then he would be sent free with with whatever documentation would prove to the other tribes or his home clan uh that he had been found innocent uh and had been protected all this time uh, uh again the, the the strange thing is that it meant that if indeed there were people who, who were uh, sent to these uh, cities of refuge or who had fled to these cities of refuge that they, they there was someone who was always praying for the death it was an inter interesting and sad kind of uh, situation. Um, we revisit the story of the daughters of Salofachad, the ones who had gone to Moses and said, Our father had no sons. Therefore, we will claim uh, the inheritance of, uh, his, of his territory. Moses goes to God and says, What do I do? And God says, Yes, their cause is just. So uh, it establishes the pattern that women. Uh, women can inherit um, in in uh, in in that line, um, and um, uh, but the, uh, uh, and and it start, starts this process again that we've referred to time and time again that there, there are changes in in what's called call them reforms if you will call them uh, progressive adaptations. Of, and the uh, and the tradition in in Judaism, there are small steps, but they do but they do happen. So the next step now becomes we agree that the daughters of Salafan can can inherit. That's that's okay. We're we're okay with that. But what if? the women if any of those women or any of the any of the other women who do inherit territory what if they marry someone from another tribe not their home tribe if they marry someone from another tribe then then the territory that they bring with them as a as a as a dowry so to speak is going to go to a different tribe and we have to you know in our territory our property is is diminished. Um, 
Moses again thinks, goes to God and says, what do I do? Moses comes back and says, okay, here's the compromise. You know, it's one of those like in Tevya. Well, he's right and he's right and you're right by saying that they're both right and, you know, and whatever. Um, so uh, Moses says, okay, the law will be that if they want to marry the daughters who have inherited, if they've inherited territory, not every, not every marriage, but if they've inherited territory, they have to marry someone from their own tribe. Okay, um, and that that way, the uh, the property does still stay and uh, is not transferred to uh, another tribe. Um, so that that becomes the the the, the final action. That's the source. Uh, I, uh, I kind of called it case, in, in introduction to case law one on one, uh, 101 um, in, in Jewish tradition. Uh, uh, situations as they started to ar uh, arise, either realistic or, or hypothetical, that they were brought to Moses. Moses, either with Moses or Aaron, would make an immediate decision or would go to God and ask for inspiration. They would go into the temple. And ask for inspiration, and God would give them uh, an answer, a resolution, whatever, and they would bring it back out to the people. That would be the case. Um, we end the book of Numbers that way. Let us be strong, strong, and strengthen each other. And so now, strengthened times two, we turn to. The fifth book of the of the Torah, uh, Devar, uh, Devarim or Deuteronomy, and I will now pass the mic over to uh, Professor David. Well, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, um, Devarim, the famous Hebrew name for the book of Deuteronomy, which is the Greek uh, name of the book. I'm going to begin this with a few quotations from Rabbi Sachs's uh, five book series called Covenant and Conversation. And um, there is significance, a number of significance of Devarim. And one of them is the prophet Hosea. One significance, a very important one, it says, he says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take the words, Devarim, with you and return to the Lord. A very, very famous quotation is actually in an old episode of Lou Grant that some of you us may be familiar with, where they actually quote from that. And uh, the, uh, the portion, he likes to translate it as, Counsel for the defense. And he goes on, he says, there are times when beneath the surface of an apparently simple verse, an intense drama is taking place. So it is with the opening verse of Parashat Devarim. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel in the desert east of the Jordan, in the Arava opposite Suf. And the sages were sensitive to the slightest nuance, heard something strange and suggestive in these words. What is the Zahav? It is the name of a place, but it has not been mentioned before. And from here, Moses is speaking audaciously, to, audaciously towards heaven. And I'm thinking about, again about Moses' very intensely personal relationship with the Almighty. It was almost as if they were sometimes like quarreling friends, partying friends, but but I don't know of anyone who's had a more personal relationship with God than Moses had. And uh, in this case, he speaks audaciously to, her, to God. And uh, what do these words mean? And he's trying to figure out it, and, uh, and they're figuring it out. Moses has been transformed into a counsel for the defense. He says to God, the people committed a sin, but you're the one who gave them the opportunity and the temptation. 
Without the gold, they could never have made the golden calf. Who told them to ask their Egyptian neighbors for gold? It was you. This was not something they did of their own accord. Therefore, you must not blame them. Please instead forgive them. I can go on and on from this, but we don't have on and on. So I'm going to set aside Rabbi Sachs' wonderful book and go on into Devarim. There are seven readings uh, that comprise Devarim, fairly long, fairly long portion. And the first reading tells how in the, they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. Moses addresses the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan River, recounting the instructions that God had given them. When the Israelites were at Horeb, Mount Sinai, God told them they had stayed long enough at that mountain. It's time for them to make their way into the hill country of Canaan, take possession of the land that God wanted to assign to them, to the heirs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the second reading, Moses appoints the leaders as chiefs of thousands, chiefs of hundreds, chiefs of fifties, chiefs of tens. Moses charged the magistrates to hear and decide disputes justly. He treats alike Israelite and stranger, low and high. And Moses directs them to bring to him any matter which was too difficult for them to decide. The Israelites set up from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea, and Moses tells God that God had placed the land at their disposal. They should not fear, but just take the land. In the third reading, the Israelites are asking Moses to send spies ahead to scout the land. And Moses approved the plan, selecting 12 men, one from each side. And Moses tells the spies not to fear, as God would go before them and would fight for them. When God heard the Israelites complaint, he became angry and vowed that not one of them in that evil generation would ever see the good land that God swore to their fathers, except for Caleb, whom God would give the land on which he had set foot because he remained loyal to God. And Moses complained right back that because, because of the people, God was incensed with Moses too, and he told him that he would not enter the land either. God then directs that Moses' attendant Joshua would enter the land and allot it to Israel. And uh, Joshua being pretty much Moses' age, at a very elderly age, is going to take over from his friend Moses. And in the fourth reading, God continued that the little ones whom the Israelites said would be carried off would also enter, would also enter and possess the land. The Israelites all replied that now they know they would go up and fight just as God commanded them. And but then God told Moses to warn them not to fight as God would not travel in their midst and they would be routed by their enemies. In fact, Moses told them that, but they would not listen. They're stiff-necked. They flouted God's command and willfully marched into the hill country. The Israelites remained at Kadesh a long time, marched back into the wilderness by the way of the Sea of Reeds, and then skirted the hill country for a long time. In the fifth reading, God then tells Moses they had been skirting the hill country long enough and they need to turn north. God instructed that the people would be passing through the territory of their kinsmen, the descendants of Esau, that the Israelites should be very careful not to provoke them and should purchase what food and water they can, make, they can do because God would not give the Israelites any of their land. So the Israelites moved on away from the descendants of Esau and marched on in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. 
God told Moses not to harass or provoke the Moabites. And um, kind of a similar thing happens like this. Uh, That's what happened before. In the sixth reading, Sihon and his men took the field against the Israelites at Jehaz. But God, true to his word, delivered him to the Israelites, and the Israelites defeated him, captured and doomed all of his towns, leaving no survivor. Um, for a supposedly peaceful people, we could be really pretty violent if we chose to be. The Israelites made their way up the road to Bashan, and uh, where they met King Og of Bashan, and his men took the field against them. Again, God told Moses not to fear, as God would deliver Og, his men, and the country to the Israelites to conquer. And in the seventh reading, the last reading, Moses defined the borders of the settlement east of the Jordan and charged the Reubenites, the Gadites. <laughs> Excuse me. Pardon me, I'm sorry. And uh, also the half tribe of um, Manasseh. And uh, the last one, the last one, as I skip back a little bit, Moses is defining the borders. And um, even though they had already received their land, they needed to serve as shock troops. And Moses charged Joshua not to fear the kingdoms west of the Jordan. And, uh, and then we leave there. And uh, then a few little notes that I would like to add here, because I'm reading up and finally, I find out that the portion is discussed in some modern sources. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter one, verse 10, Moses reports that God had multiplied the Israelites until they were then as numerous as the stars. In Genesis 15, God promised that Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars of heaven. I believe that God was speaking figuratively in that case, since the number of stars in our galaxy uh, is over 400 billion, and we did, certainly didn't, Moses was not about to lead 400 billion Israelites to the promised land. But, um, but at the time, if, I, if God is listening to what I am to say, he's about to strike me with lightning, as I almost did last night, because he is saying you have to go back to what the stars were at the time. There were no telescopes, and on a clear night, the Israelites could see about five or 6,000 stars in the sky. There were more than that that uh, Moses had to wander with through the desert. God promised that Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands <clears> of the <throat> seashore. And Carl Sagan on Cosmos reported there are more stars in the universe than sands on all the beaches of the earth. And now, um, we do have the, uh, if I can find it here, I wish to go in a little bit about the, um, oh, I guess I cannot find it. Um, the Haftorah, I want to just address the Haftorah briefly. Thank you for your patience. I will refund all of your money for today's session. <laughs> Thank you. We'll hold you to uh, it. Okay, thanks so much, and you may. Devarim is always read on the first, the final Shabbat of admonition, and it's a Shabbat immediately prior to Tisha B'Av. And it's also Shabbat Chazon, corresponding to the first word of the Haftura, which from, comes from Isaiah chapter 1. Talks about the 12 spies that are sent by Moses to observe the land of Canaan. They return from their mission. And only two of the spies brought a positive report. That's Joshua and Caleb. All the others 
spoke disparagingly about the land. So they are now saying that the land that God has given them isn't what they want, and they don't want to make a sale. The majority report caused the children of Israel, of course, the stiff-necked children of Israel, to cry, panic, and despair, even after entering the promised land. For this, they were punished by God that the generation would not enter the land. The Midrash quotes God as saying about this event, you cried before me pointlessly, and I will fix you this day of crying for the generations. And I believe this is the, the seed by which the uh, fall of the two temples, the Babylonian temple, King Solomon's temple in 586 BCE, and then the uh, second temple, Herod's temple, in, uh, in early in the uh, common era. And the first temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BCE. And uh, they, that began the Babylonian exile. The second temple was built by Ezra and Nehemiah and also Herod and was destroyed by the Romans in 70, 70 CE, scattering the people of Judea and commencing the Jewish exile from the Holy Land. And the temple has still not been rebuilt after all that time. So when we observe Tisha B'Av here, we are remembering the fall of the two temples, plus an awful lot of other unhappy and unfortunate events that have happened to our people. Romans subsequently crushed by Kochba's revolt and destroyed the city of Betar, and they killed over 500,000 Jewish civilians, which is an awful lot of people but nowhere near as much as Hitler was accused of killing during the Second World War, Hitler and his, his people. Anyway, we come to the end of um, Devarim. I found it fascinating. And once again, if you want your money back, just call <laughs> and let me know. And now back to you, Rabbi Roman. Thank you, David. Amy, do you have questions? I have two questions. What is a half? We'll charge you, we'll charge you double, you know. <laughs> well, I have money coming back from Duvid. And oh, okay. All right. Okay. So I, I, I'm transferred, good. Transferred into, into the other account. All right. Right. I'm good with that. Um, you mentioned, I believe it was Manasseh was a half tribe. What is a half tribe? Well, um, Ephraim and Manasseh are the sons of Joseph, right? Okay. The, when we talk about the, the 12 tribes of Israel, J Jacob didn't have 12 sons, right? So, but Joseph doesn't, and it doesn't Joseph doesn't become a, a tribe, but his two sons share oh. the, the each, so that each is considered you know they don't they don't refer to it as the tribe of Joseph. It's the tribe of Ephraim, the tribe of Manasseh, but they're actually only half, half, half. Like, what is that? They're not step 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 brothers. They're half brothers, right? Or, you know, something <laughs> like. It, but it's the same mother. But what? You, you get what I'm talking about. Okay. I do. I okay. do. All right. I'm now stumbling, my step something from words. <laughs> My second question is, you mentioned that the soldiers, um, after battle, after they had killed people, um, had a mikvah for a cleansing. Um, what would that look like in the middle of a desert? Well, there were still oases in the, uh, middle, so in the, middle, of the in the middle of the desert. Right. So they you could know, they, immerse they in water? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if it wasn't, if it, it, it's not, a, I mean, it becomes ultimately later on, so, you know, centuries later, it becomes a total immersion. Here, it's just, it's a ritual cleansing. It's like on, like on Passover, we have the ritual of washing our, washing our hands to purify ourselves, to participate in the reenactment of the Exodus. Okay. We don't all go into the, into the bathroom and, and share the bathtub, 
uh, and totally and totally immerse. Later on in Jewish history, when it especially when it becomes a sign of joining the community, and uh, and or of cleansing the bodily the body totally after having been in the presence of a of a corpse or something or flowing blood that might that would render your prayers impure your sacrifice is unacceptable then it got to be a total a total immersion which probably also had hygienic uh, uh you know reasoning behind it behind it also uh, but but in the earliest form it was only a, a symbolic symbolic cleansing they were they weren't able to totally immerse themselves uh, or all of the you know all the troops be able to do that at the same time thank you you're welcome thank um you. david you you led into uh uh i don't remember if you, you know you said it wasn't wasn't uh uh rabbi Sachs. it was uh somebody else who had made the made the connection or asked the question you know which is which is the which is the better blessing to be as numerous as the stars of the heaven or as the grains of sand, uh, you, you know, uh, by the by the water, uh, you know, based on the promise that was made to Abraham and Sarah. So, uh, but the answer was that there are many more stars than there are grains of sand. Oh yes, according according to Carl Sagan. Oh, it's Carl Sagan. Okay. That very uh, seriously on his uh, show so long ago, Cosmos. And I remember listening to when he said that, and I was actually watching that episode with some Jehovah's Witness friends of mine. And right away they said, no, that's not true. And, uh, but it's something that's debated. It's not, it certainly wouldn't be true literally today, but in the time that the Israelites were in the desert and looking at the stars, the maximum that they could see there without optical aid, which they did not have access to, would have been about two or 3,000 at one time. If you go into a big city, you look up at the sky, you might see five or six stars, but under clear sky, they go into the thousands. And it makes, it makes that statement kind right. of funny. Okay. And interesting. And 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 the, the parameters of the world that they were referring to was much smaller also. They were, you know, so. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll move on. The second Parsha in, uh, in Deuteronomy um, is, um, oh, uh, is, is known as Va'et Hanan. Uh, and, and just one, one other word that um, uh, before entering into the specific Parsha. Uh, most scholars uh, agree that Deuteronomy is not only written by a different author, but it's written several hundred years later. Um, so it, the, 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 the literary style is, is different in, in, many, in many places. Vocabulary uh, is, is different as the, 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 you know, the, the slang and the nuance changes over over time culturally does so even in our in in our own english language and, and americanese if you will um but deuteron deutero is it means second so deuteronomy is is the second telling if you will uh in rabbinic hebrew deuteronomy is known as mishneh torah or uh, a, a a second teaching of the torah or a review of 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 the Torah, uh, it basically contains Moses's farewell sermon. Um, uh, and if you think that this rabbi or rabbis that you might know from some other parts of North America, if you think our sermons are long, just you know look how long Mo Moses you know talked without benefit of a microphone. Uh, so uh, it's his farewell sermon and. Uh, and I frequently like to point out he, that we don't we think we talk of Moses as the teacher, Moses as the lawgiver, uh, and the, but Moses was also a great orator, and and at least in the way that the writer uh, of Deuteronomy of Devarim describes it, uh, of course he wasn't he wasn't there 
to as an eyewitness and he wasn't taking notes or a, a stenographer um but um but some of the or oratory is is very very powerful and the connection can be made in style uh i don't know whether martin luther king jr i'm sure he was aware of moses's farewell sermon you know being knowledgeable in in the bible but when when dr king kept on referring to in the most famous speech i have a dream i have a dream i have a dream moses moses's parallel opening to many paragraphs is shema yisrael you know it's listen o israel hero hear o israel it's a literary it's an oratorical style uh that 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 he uses uh at the beginning with Ve'etchanan, which is the name of the portion, uh, Moses is, again, is retelling everything. Uh, and why does he have to retell it? Um, because this is now the generation, this is now the generation that didn't experience Exodus from Egypt, crossing the Sea of Reeds, even standing at Mount Sinai. All of them, with the exception of, at this point, Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, we're not sure about any of the women, but Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, everyone else from the from the Exodus experience and the Sinai experience has passed away. Now these are their their children, if not even their grandchildren, 40 years later. Um, so Moses is not only he's not just reminding them of what they might have heard, he's teaching them to remember, listen, O Israel, this is your story. This is what we encountered. This now belongs belongs to you as your legacy. Uh, there was a time, he says, that I pleaded with God, you know, please let me enter the promised land. Let me cross over the, the Jordan River. I'm sorry for the times that I disappointed you, that I let you down, that, you know, da, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. God still says, no, you can ascend to the, to the top of the mountain and you can look out over the Jordan, but you shall not cross over. Um, again, Shema Yisrael, listen, O Israel, listen, because I want you to understand this and I want you to own it, we would say, uh, to, we would say today, this is your story. Um, Moses adds three more cities of refuge. We had spoken about the six previously. We don't know whether he added three more because he now envisioned uh, a, a larger amount of territory uh that uh, uh that the people were going to uh, occupy or whether there were so many occasions of people who needed to go to the cities of refuge that they had a need for three additional ones we just don't know um the is a, is a very very rich rich portion uh it includes uh, a, a re, um, not only a revisiting, but a revision of the Ten Commandments uh, as Moses is telling the story. Um, there are some minor changes. There are some major changes in the words, and uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, talking about them. Uh, certainly in the in the Saturday morning Torah uh, Torah study class also just as as far as a a minor change uh which makes sense is in the um in the uh uh initial set back in in exodus uh uh moses says in the ten commandments or god says however you want to you want to think of it um uh uh, Moses tells the people one of the Ten Commandments is, uh, you know, um, uh, observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Uh, and then by the time of, uh, of Deuteronomy, at the end of the wilderness experience is rem remember the Sabbath day. Uh, the, verb, the verb changes, um, whether they weren't all remembering, whatever, whatever, for whatever reason, Moses felt it was very important to change the imperative there. Uh, and that's why in Lachadodi, we say Shamor Vizachor Bedibur Echad, that to uh, observe and remember really means the same thing, according to the composer of, of the song, uh, Shlomo Al-Kabez. 
Um, but and some of the and some of the major changes, uh, the the most famous and perhaps the most significant is that in the tenth commandment, in "Thou shalt not covet," uh, at first in the first version of the ten commandments, the wife is merely considered a piece of property of the husband. By forty years later, now there's a separate uh identifying verb for uh the relationship between uh, um, uh, a husband and a wife and between a man and the wife of his neighbor it's a separate uh a separate verb uh delineating between the relation the human relationship of a man to a woman and then also all the other the, the what other things would be considered his property his his ox, his beast of burden, his um, his his slave, his servants, uh, his, uh, his kitchen utensils, whatever whatever it might be, uh, his Mercedes Benz or Tesla. <laughs> uh, we get to then the most the most famous part uh, of of Moses's sermon, literally. Um, is the recitation of Shema. Uh, Shema Yisrael, again, hear, O Israel, listen, O Israel. I'm, I, this is what I'm telling you. I have a dream. This is what I'm telling you. This is your past. This will now be your future. Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or the Lord, this, this our God is unique. Again, you can get into, we could have, Two full classes, classes I'm sure, just of just of uh, coming up with different translations and how they resonate with uh, with each of us. Um, most the Baruch Shem uh, Kavod line, is the response line that the people respond to when the leader in worship proclaims Shema Yisrael, the Baruch Shem Kavod line which in many communities is recited, not silently, but quietly, uh, as opposed to uh, part of an affirmation that comes, that, that's not from the Torah. It, it's, added, it's added much later. Um, and then, you, then we have the via hafta, the, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, with, our, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, uh, whichever translation, again, that, that, that you like. And, and actually, there's much more commentary on that in 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 the, in the traditional text uh, in in the prayer book. There are three paragraphs uh, in the in the book that we use at Bethlehem Temple Center of the Reform Movement and the Reconstructionist Movement. Uh, mostly use they, we we use the the first paragraph and the last several lines of the of the third paragraph. Um, it's not only to make the service a little bit shorter, but it's also because one of the middle paragraphs talks a lot about about seat seat and uh, the fringes on your talus. And since most Jews uh, in Reform and Reconstructionist certainly early on in earlier days did not wear uh, seat seat, did not wear the fringes, so it was an uh, it was kind of uh, dropped out of the out of, out of the out of the liturgy, but the the the, the literature and the commentaries are filled with questions, answers, suggestions on what does it mean to be et Adonai Lecha, to, to love God uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What do all those phrases mean? Why are they there? What are the emotions that they represent? How do, how do our actions reflect those emotions and how does that lead up to loving? Uh, I, I, I can remember uh, not every conversation, obviously, but you know, you know uh, uh, 45, 50 years of conversations with, with second and third graders uh, in, in Sunday school classes. Uh, well, what do you think it means to love God? Is it like loving a hamburger? Is it like loving your, 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 your puppy dog? Is it the same kind of love? Is it the same kind of love as as you love your mommy and your daddy and your your grandma and your grandma and your your, your grandma and your your grandpa and 
Um, and uh, of course, you don't love your older brother or sister, you know, that, uh, that joke that makes sense, something like that. But, uh, you know, in, 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 in Hebrew as well as English, English, it's the same verb. And yet it, it uh, leads us into so many different uh, connotations of what it means to love. So uh, I'm only just going to share with you the one. It's not the most famous, but it, but it's one that I like to refer back to, and it's the the interpretation of uh, or the teaching of Rambam of Maimonides, who said there are actually when you're talking about loving God as opposed to loving your mother, your father, your your uh, you know your uh, your spouse, your you know. Your Tesla, whatever, whatever challenge my steps on when you talk to you about Tesla. What does that mean? Is it is the same as like you love your daddy and your mom? Um, that Maimonides says there are really two. The, the love of God can be described with as two stages. Uh, uh, the fall of Avcha, the fall of Nashcha, the fall, and even though there are three. Uh, uh, three statements in, in, in that with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But Maimonides uh, brings it down to two. Stage one is striving to love in the sense of understanding and participating with God in the redemption of the world. Okay. Um, and then step two is uh, not only proclaiming that love, but summoning, is my Maimonides' word, summoning others to join in the love of God. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're trying to convert them to Judaism, but but summoning, summoning them to find their own sense of identifying with, believing in, accepting, and 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 loving God. And that's, you know, that's a very, very brief uh, summation of of Maimonides, uh, again, there are many, many, and some more famous in describing uh, the the via hafta uh, kind of thing. But the Etzanan is a very, very rich, rich portion. And again, we could probably spend two or three sessions just on on dealing with that text, and probably in about three or four years, Saturday morning, I, I suppose. Um, uh, David mentioned that last week was called Shabbat Chazon. Uh, uh, the, we talked about that being the uh, the Shabbat of of, of vision, uh, vision that that comes that comes out of the, uh, the, having seen the destruction, but trying to have the uh, the destruction of the temples uh, and other catastrophes, but then having the vision to be able to look beyond that. Uh, into uh, into a, 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 a hopeful hopeful future. Um, the tradition is to read the book of Echa of the Lamentations on Tisha B'Av. So I want to spend a, just a few minutes uh, about about that. Um, Echa uh, Lamentations uh, is uh, one of the five scrolls that that are traditionally included in the in the Hebrew canon, in the official list of books of the um, of the Bible, of the Tanakh, um, and it deals with a specific historical event, the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem by the Babylonians in the year 586 BCE. Traditionally, Jeru uh, Jer traditionally uh, Jeremiah is considered the author of uh, these keynote. Now. Um, keynote, the, the best English translation would be laments, um, uh, uh, that mourn the destroyed city and the massacred people. Um, in the Christian canon, uh, the King James Version, for example, the New Jerusalem Bible, uh, the Revised Standard Version, uh, in the Christian Bible, they place uh, lamentations right after the book of Jeremiah, uh, there in the in the section of the prophets, but um, in the in the Jewish canon, in the Jewish order, 
it's placed in the book in the uh, the section known as the the writings, the holy writings, the Ketuvim. Yes, Steve. No, I, I just wanted to ask if modern scholarship supports the traditional view. No, no, I'm going to get that. Was, oh, sorry, okay. you're one sentence ahead of me. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, modern scholars, literally, that's my next sentence. Modern scholars say no. There are too many inconsistencies in, in the message. Jeremiah had hope in his vision, referring back to what I said before about Shabbat Chazon, that there, was, there would be hope, hope at the end, but Lamentations does not have that. It, um, in, in, indeed, the quote is that, that we find no vision from the Lord whatsoever. Um, Jeremiah would not have praised King Zedekiah, uh, but in, and indeed he pronounced the fall of Jerusalem as an outcome of the evil leadership of Zedekiah more than anything else, whereas Lamentations blames the, f the failings of all the people, and the phrase that uh, comes up again and again and again in discussing modern Hebrew, modern Israel of uh, sinat chinam, of baseless, uh, baseless um, uh, hatred. In style, Jeremiah is free-flowing and expansive. Lamentation is filled with uh, uh, acrostics, uh, you know, like with sentence one begins with an A, sentence B, or with an Aleph, sentence B with a Bet, sentence C with a, with a sentence three with a Gimel, et cetera, et cetera. There are several of those. Um, Lamentations is filled with acrostics and pithy statements. It's almost poetic. It has an identifiable cadence. Indeed, if you hear if you hear the special uh, uh, trope chant for Lamentations, it it follows a totally different cadence and rhythm than most of the other trope, certainly from the Torah and from uh, much of the other Haftarah uh, readings. Um, it's unique. It's sad. It's touched with sounds of mourning and grief and sorrow. There's no real, what we call nechemta. There's no real resolution of comfort that comes out of the book of Lamentations. In some Jewish communities to mark the theme of destruction and pain, uh, when they read Lamentations, they don't even include the blessings because the blessings uh, for a Haftarah or the blessings for reading from uh, other than from the scroll of the Torah seem to always have it. It leads up to this is an uplift at the end. There's kind of a climax at the end of the blessings. And the many communities decide that was inappropriate for reading Lamentations. Uh, in other communities, Jews gather around solitary candles and read softly. Then I want to I want to share with you before just a few uh, a, a few verses from the book. Uh, this is from an introduction to um, uh, to Lamentations by two of my teachers, Rabbi Herb Bronstein of Chicago and Rabbi Albert Friedlander in London. They say more than a city dies in Lamentations. The future, the dream, the sanctuary, all are in ruins. It is a religious text which tries to deal with the crumbling of faith in a world where the center, the foundation of his existence itself, does not hold, and it turns to dust. But our text speaks of a God who can and will forgive, who will make restitution, who will renew our days as of old. Lamentations is a word of faith in God, faith found in darkest times, and therefore particularly suited to our days. We read it on Tisha B'Av, but on that dark day, our people also experience the hope which has not been forced beyond the boundaries of existence. Faith is reconstituted as it senses on another level the continuing struggle with evil, which has not ended to surrender or total silence. In this way, the scroll of lamentations can become part of our personal affirmation. After Auschwitz, Theodore Adorno had written that no more poems could now be written. And he was wrong. Had he read the scroll of Lamentations, he might have realized that after destruction, there must be an opportunity to express the anguish and pain, that there must be the reassertion of the self, the rediscovery of hope. 
when the rabbis assigned the scriptural reading for the Sabbath, they, for this Sabbath, they did not permit the prophetic reading to end on a negative note. Some verses of affirmation, hope, and renewed vision had to be added. Lamentations has to follow that rule, although it only does it really with one sentence. We know it mostly from the end of our Torah service and certainly from Yom Kippur. Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Benashuva Chadesh Aleinu Kekedem. Turn us unto you, O Lord, we shall be turned. Renew our days as, as of old. This is more than a matter of ancient, ancient convention. It's a statement to which affirmation beyond despair becomes an essential component of faith. It is the final statement of faith in a text written by those who had seen unspeakable affliction. This affirmation is central to our understanding of the scroll of Lamentations. So having said that, it begins, Echa yashvavadad ha'ir rabati am haitaka almana. Alas, how solitary does the city sit that was so full of people how she has become a widow. She was she that was great among the nations and princes among the provinces. How is she become tributary? Bitterly does she weep at night. Her tears are, are on her cheeks. Among her lovers, there is none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. And incidentally, that's an acrostic. That's Echa Yashvavadat was with an Aleph. Bahu Tivne Balaila is with a bet. Uh, Galta Yehuda is with a gimel, etc., etc., etc. And then um, that's that's the beginning, and I'll cut it short. Then at the the very end, again, we were mentioning at the end of chapter five, uh, not the very last verse, but the second to last verses. Ata Adonai Olam Teshev Kisachal David v'David Kisecha. Kisecha le dor vador, lama la netzach, tish kachenu, taazvenu le orech yamim, hashivenu adonai lecha benashuva, kadesh yamenu kekedem. O Lord, you remain forever. Your throne is from generation to generation. Why will you forget, forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Turn us unto you, O Lord, you shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. So that Good will question. conclude. Please, Steve, go ahead. Yep, you know, just uh, curious about what what the traditional view and what the um, modern views are of uh, uh, having Jerusalem uh, be uh, shown as a as a uh, female or as a widow. Um, does that have anything? I'm wondering if that has anything to do with the uh, sort of bride and bridegroom relationship with God, or well, well, probably I'll, just in in the poetic sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I think in the I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah. Right. My, my modern view would be sort of poetic, but I'm wondering if the rabbis have a drosh on it. You know, uh, you know what what they're. Perhaps. Well, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with any particular drosh that leap, leap, that leaps out at me. Uh, yeah, but yes, there are the there are the 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 references to uh, you know, and we talked about uh, Psalm one thirty seven of the you know the city sits solitary, uh, you know, and 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 all and 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 all alone. Or, or Shira you know, her, uh, right, yeah, and she is like a bride. Her, her children have deserted her. Children have deserted her. Uh, you know, th and and things like that. But um, I'm sure there's there there's plenty of uh, alliterative uh, material. Uh, none of them that necessarily. Uh, we could, if we had the time, we could go looking up in some of the references. But but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but not um, not that not not any that particularly come to mind, other than um, in the Psalms. Drew, I, I can't say exclusively, but it it seems to me doing a quick thought through my memory bank, 
it seems to me that when Jerusalem or Zion is referred to in the Psalms, it's always in the in the feminine. Yerushalayim shafchu brala yachdav, that uh, you know that, that all that all should gather around her together, things like things like that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, okay, so we we we've got a couple of minutes. Steve, what did you you wanted to either ask or make some comment? On well, well, I I I just I'm I I I appreciate you you know uh, letting us know that there's a ceasefire that's holding. I I just I didn't really have the up to date information myself. All I know is on Friday there was a preemptive strike by Israel against uh, Islamic Jihad uh, targets, and yes. that there was a big retaliation from Gaza. You know, luckily, uh, Iron Dome worked very well, and I think they uh, they got all the missiles. Or there as were, far as I know, I, really I, heard, I heard from some friends who, uh, two rabbis, the two women, they're both rabbis uh, married to each other from Los Angeles, who were leading an interfaith trip to Israel, and they were at Friday night services on the beach in Tel Aviv. And the services were interrupted by the sirens going off and everyone having to go into a in into a shelter. So so yes, there was I guess it was about seventy two hours worth of um, of of shelling. Uh, I haven't heard of any major uh, either property or thank God no loss of life or or significant injury uh, in in Israel. There were. The, I, I heard the number at least 450 missiles that were fired uh, into Israel by by Islamic Jihad, uh, all aimed at population centers um, and residences. There were there definitely were deaths on uh, in Gaza, uh, uh, although again the Israelis claim that um, uh, they were they were uh, specifically targeted. That the buildings in which the the buildings that were to be hit with with rockets were all warned warned in advance, which is the, which is the Israeli Israeli pattern. They give people they give residents of buildings I think it's two hours of advance notice that uh, that their building is going to be is going to be targeted. Um, the the uh, one of the one of the events that uh, specifically led up to um, this fighting was the assassination by Israel, at least the assumption is by Israel, I think they claimed it, um, of, the, uh, of the, the commander in northern Gaza of Islamic Jihad. Uh, and then just, I think, last night, they also claimed to have assassinated the the commander in the south of Gaza of Islamic Jihad. Um, two two other comments I would make. Um, one that's interesting and one that doesn't surprise us. The interesting is, thing is that Hamas, which controls Gaza, Islamic Jihad is a much smaller smaller group and they, they they do battle for power somewhat but Hamas stayed out of this they stayed out of it entirely they they the, the Islamic jihad was asking them to come in and start uh, you know and and they said no this you know you started this yeah, you know you you have to finish it one way or the other uh, and uh, the ceasefire was brokered by Egypt which is which is good but again what the, the sad what's sad, but not surprising is that universally all of the media make Israel the bad guy. You know, you know, strong, strong Goliath. Israel is picking on poor little David uh, in in the Gaza Strip, kind 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 of thing, and just in the in the way that it's portrayed. Very 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 sad, but not not unexpected. Uh, Rabbi, if I could make a comment, please don't we go. I'm particularly pleased that Steve is here today with his backdrop of the Western Wall, which reminds me of my visit there back in 1976. 
And one of the things I was taught there is that the wall is supposed to be the ruin, the what's left of the Western Wall of Herod's Temple. No, no, no. It's the it's the Western Wall of the retaining wall that was on the top at yeah. the top of the yeah. mountain that supported the flat the the flat area where the temple was built. But it's not the Western Wall of the temple. Right. Sorry, okay. to, sorry to interrupt. I, boy, I have to refund your money a second time. The other thing is that I was also taught was that some of these rocks at the very bottom might be traced back to Solomon's temple. But yes. Never, never, never. That, you know, some of them are huge. Absolutely, absolutely huge. And it, it it's a marvel as how they would have been, uh, you know, moved to be able to be uh, be used in the as as building blocks, um, uh, Amy, please. Uh, just very briefly, something that I think is hilariously funny, uh, having to do with Al Qaeda, the British intelligence service uh, intercepted some bomb making plans from Al Qaeda and went in and substituted a recipe for making cupcakes. <laughs> and I got such a kick out of that. This, this was recent that you just heard about this? Well, I, I read about it in an article that a friend of mine sent me, and I can't find the source okay. of this, but I assume that it's within the past year. Anyway, I got a, a big chuckle out of that. Great. Okay. <laughs> one 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 last little comment that I'll make, and I I admit that it's it's um it's it's highly highly personal uh f with a uh, uh with an aspect of of modern modern Israel that I'm that I'm somewhat in, in involved with. You may have heard that over the last three weeks there um there were families from the United States. They happen to be conservative. Uh, in their orientation, uh, there were families from the United States that wanted to have uh, bar and bat mitzvah ceremonies for their 13-year-old kids in the area that that's. So if you look again over Steve's left shoulder, farther down to the right, right, you know, uh, more to the right of it's actually that's actually facing south. Uh, from that rubble that we see there, there's a there's a there's a section called the egalitarian section. Uh, hopefully, there were plans that it was going to be much larger and given the same amount of, of of care and support as the regular Western Wall. That hasn't that hasn't happened. But that's supposed to be the area where reform, conservative, uh, you know, liberal, orthodox, and whatever, where they could have their ceremonies and men and women could be praying together. Women could read from the Torah, things like that. So there's several families over the last several weeks that were trying to have their their ceremonies uh, that uh, had arranged it through the government and whatever. Um, and they were all uh, the, a polite word would be interrupted. Uh, a, a more exact word would be they were um, uh, uh, they were literally. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Or yeah, harassed. A, 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 a harassed and um, and and uh, ultra orthodox uh, kids, especially, but some adults um, were trying to rip the Torah scroll uh, off the mm -hmm. off the table. They took one of the prayer books that the family had had published, uh, tore the pages, tore the pages mm -hmm. up. There, there's a, there's a a, a a a camera. One of the the photographer who was there to photograph the the um, uh, the uh, the bat mitzvah ceremony uh, caught on film uh, of one of these ultra orthodox boys using a page from the prayer book to wipe his nose and then threw it on the ground and was stepping on it whatever a real chilul Hashem desecration of God of God's name um, and and the government officially and certainly the authority that that uh, is in charge of the of, of the wall. Is, is not doing anything. The police really weren't doing anything. 
Um, but uh, a name that you might be familiar with, Deborah Lipstadt, uh, who is one of the foremost authorities on uh, anti-Semitism around the world and, and the Holocaust. She, she's now Professor Emeritus at Emory in a, Atlanta. Um, she's the, uh, the US uh, special representative or special ambassador or whatever uh, uh, to international groups focusing on anti-Semitism and racism and persecution and whatever. She happened to be in Israel. She wasn't at the, at the wall that day, but she happened to be there. And she wrote an op-ed that, that was published in, in certainly in the Israeli papers uh, and a number of Jewish sources around here where she said, if that had happened in any other country in the world and had been you know, publicized of, you know, a, a, a bar of, that was, you know, that was utterly, utterly decimated by, you know, by other people, you know, it, it, it would make, it would make headline news anywhere else in the world, except in Israel. It's that, you know, it's that, it's that sad that this is an issue that the, that Israel just has not been able to, uh, to agree to. I'll be talking about it much more, I'm sure, on the high holidays. And with those who are in Israel, to, we're all together in November. But um, but wanted to bring that up, especially in light of all of our discussion. So with that, my alarm just went off. It's time to put some more drops in my eyes for the cataract <laughs> surgeries. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, for being with us. I'm going to send out our little reminder note uh, that we're meeting on the third Monday in September, so the 19th. Ruth Ann, do we have to let um, Stacy know, or for the calendar, or you, or can you make the change? I can make the change. Okay, I'll go and I'll go and do it right now, so I don't forget. Great. Okay, all right, super. Thanks, everyone. Be well. We'll you see you too. Thanks for your patience. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye.